Welcome to Steve Reads Bible Stories. Reverend Steve Janes reads Bible stories while pointing out keys and principles on how to read the Bible. Hi, my name is Steve Janes, and this is the More Abundant Life Podcast. This is episode number 319, Giving and Receiving. The Church Epistles, Doctrine, Reproof, and Correction. We're going to go in order of the way the books are written in the Bible, starting at Romans, to see the changes made in the new administration, the administration of grace. All righty, well, God bless you all in the wonderful name of our risen Lord and Savior. And today we're going to get into the subject of the church epistles, doctrine, reproof, and correction. And this is the final uh, segment of the teaching series on giving and receiving. And we're going to look at the church epistles to get that doctrine, reproof, and correction so that we can be blessed with the knowledge of God's Word and perform God's Word, the doing of it. So that will be pretty neat. So to get started with, we're going to start in Romans chapter 12 and in verse 13. And this is the first Uh, section through the church epistles that deal with giving and receiving. And it's a pretty simple verse, and I've always liked it. Verse 13 says, Distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. Distributing means to share or to partake or supporting. Another word to look at, helping, helping out. Being a help, being a blessing, distributing to the necessity of the saints, which is pretty neat. And what we're going to see through this teaching that that word, the way the way that word saint is used in this context, is talking about ministers that work all the time on getting the word to people, ministers of the word, because when the ministers of the word are able to function freely, then all saints get blessed. Okay? So we're going to, it says here, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. And let's go to the next chapter, chapter 13. And this is the next section that deals with some giving and receiving. And I'm going to tell you that I have read this section over and over again, especially when I had plenty of anxiety of what I wanted to do and what leaders above me wanted me to do, and they didn't agree. And it would cause much angst in me and much, uh, you know, anxiety, just trying to figure out what should I do. But I would read this over and over again to see what it says. And now I'm going to share some of that with you. And it says in verse 1 of chapter 13, it says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. And that word powers is exousia. Authority, you know, exercise power. It says, For there is no power but of God. The powers that be or ordained of God. And that's quite a thing. Now, this is not talking about anything in the secular world. This is talking about in the ministry of God's word. In the ministry of God's word, God has his hand in there. And the people who are above you, who are running fellowships or running other things, you know, they are there because of God. God has worked within them and They have gotten to the point where they are in that position. God watches over his word and God watches over the ministry of his word. So when someone is in that position, you got to think, hey, that person is ordained of God. And that's hard to do when you don't agree with them. Let's keep reading. Therefore... It says, uh, whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinances of God. 
and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. So when that situation comes up, you're better off not resisting the power of God. But if, you, if you're still in a position where you don't agree and you don't know what to do, what you do and what I did is I prayed a lot. I said, God, I don't really understand what's going on. Help me, God, with this situation. It doesn't seem right what I've been told to do. What should I do? And read lots of God's word to help figure out the answers. And then verse 3 says, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. Whenever you're in a situation like that, uh, the rulers, the leaders that we are under, they're all good people. They all want to do the word of God. They, but they're not perfect. They make mistakes. And so a lot of what they do will be just to help the word of God move along. And so you have to be patient and pray and ask God for understanding. Either show me what I'm missing or how we can change it so that we can do the word of God. Because both of us want to do the word of God. Verse 4 says, For he is a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. If what he says is really something you can figure out, yeah, I probably shouldn't do that. Well, then, you know, be afraid. You know, watch out for that. For he beareth not the sword in vain. What's the sword? The word of God. The word of God. He's given the word of God. He doesn't do it in vain. For he is a minister of God. And that's why you have to just settle down and do the 90% that you can do and be blessed and keep praying and trying to figure out the part you don't. And try not to get all anxiety about it, but I know how that works. He's a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon them that does evil. Well, if you don't think you're doing evil, then you just say, okay, well, I'm going to do good and continue to do good. Verse 5, therefore, ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. You know, be, if you're all anxiety, that's not a good conscience. You got to just be at peace, knowing that God is involved and he can work with you and the powers from above. Right? And in verse 9 says, And for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. They're, that's what they're doing. They are, they are ministers of God, and they are working on this continuously. That's what they're doing. That's what their mind is on. Their mind is not on making it hard for you. Their mind is what? Does the word say, thus saith the Lord, you know? And if they make a mistake or if there is some misunderstanding, well, that will all be so sorted out in time. And it, it's always happened with me too. Whenever I was in those positions, I didn't always like what went on. And as time went on, things changed. They changed for them and what they wanted to do. And they changed for me and what I wanted to do. And we all wanted to do the word. Um, verse 7 says, Render therefore to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear or respect to whom fear, honor to whom honor. That's why you still give the honor and respect. Because of their position, their stand, they're a leader, they're an elder in the, in the ministry of God, and you just relax. Everything changes anyhow, and you just keep doing good that you know to do. And you do this, you render to them, tribute to whom tribute, you know, custom to who custom. Uh, verse 8 says, Owe no man anything but to love him, 
For he that, that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Love is the end of the law. We love one another. And so you just continue to love. And you continue to support and help the ministry of God's word. You get involved and do it. Verse 9 says, For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not um, kill, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. But in the subject of giving and, see, and receiving, we're to pay true, pay tribute to those men who are above us. And we don't do it because, well, everything they say is right, because I can tell you that's not going to happen ever. We're all men. We're not God. But we serve God, them and us. And so we support them, knowing that all things work together for good to them that love God. And we're going to see that as we continue to read God's word. Let's go to chapter 15 in Romans. Chapter 15, and we're going to start in verse 25 on the subject of giving and receiving. And as I'm reading these different records, think about this. Is it doctrine? Is it reproof or correction that you're learning? I'll let you guys figure that out. But in verse 25, it says, But now I go to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. He's going to Jerusalem, he's, and when he's, he's going there to minister to them. What? The word of God. We know that from God's word. For it hath pleased them of uh, Mechabedonia and Achaia to make a certain... Uh, contribu contribution. contribution to the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. Uh, I want to stop here for a minute and look at that poor saints. The word poor is a Greek word. It's spelled P-T-O-K-E-S. You know, pronounce it however you like. Poor. And the poor means crouching or leaning on the arms of another. In lots of the definitions that I looked at it, it says a poor, a beggar man, a poor man, man without wealth, stuff like that, you know? But in this context, in the context of giving and receiving, what I believe it means is to the saints that are uh, relying or leaning on the arms of others so that they can do their job. And their job is to uh, minister God's word to people. Just like in the Old Testament records, the priests and Levites got the tithes and offerings so that they could work in the temple and take care of God's people. In this administration, it's they still need to you know, have funds to do their job and to do it well. But the difference is they need, in our administration, to lean on the arms of others. Okay? And he says, they're contributing to those poor saints which are at Jerusalem. And it has pleased them, them of, and you'll see this in the context, I, I think, it pleased them of Mechabedonia and Achaia, that's them, uh, verily, and their debtors are, their, uh, okay, their debtors they are, for if the Gentiles have been made partakers of the spiritual things, see, the Gentiles receive the spiritual things which are taught by ministers of God teaching God's word. That's how they're getting there their thing, and their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. See, that's pretty simple when you see it in that context, what that word poor means. The ones that bring the spiritual things are God's ministers. And then the others 
a minister to them back the carnal things. Then, I says, then therefore I have performed this, when therefore I have performed this, and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come to you, I will come by you unto Spain. But we know that Paul never really did make it to Spain, but he did make it to Rome. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, as we're working our way through the church epistles, to chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 1. And we're going to see the subject grow here. And a lot of people believe that the Corinthians is a, what kind of epistle? It's a reproof epistle, right? Uh, chapter 9, verse 1. Am I an apostle? No. What? Am I not an apostle? Am I not, Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ the, our Lord, are not ye my work in the Lord? And in the King James, it has question marks. And the answer to all those things is yes. He is an apostle. He is free. He has seen the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, are not you my work in the Lord? He says, didn't I witness to you? Aren't you part of my fellowship? Didn't I teach you the word? That's what he's saying. If... I be not an apostle unto others, yea, yet doubtless I am to you, talking to the Corinthians. For unto you, for the seal of my apostleship are ye in the Lord. You believe the word? The reason is, I taught you the word. That's the seal. Can't hide from it. Why do you believe? Because Paul came and taught him. My answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to, and to drink? Well, yeah, I think you do. Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? Now, that's an interesting thing. He's saying, don't I have the same abilities to do stuff as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas. And it says here in the King James, it says the brethren of the Lord. If it's the brethren of the Lord, it would be James and Cephas. Or I only in Paul have not we power to forbear working. You know, do we have to work to get our body and soul stuff together? Do we? Me and Paul have to. The others don't, but we do. That's what he's saying. Who goeth to war for fair at time, any time at his own charge? Or who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth the flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? He says, who, do, who does this at his own will? Ministers that are out teaching God's word, do they do this at their own will? They wouldn't do it very long if it was because it's not much of a job when no one takes care of them. They have to work twice as hard. They have to work to keep body and soul together, a secular job. Then they have to do work again to take care of the body of Christ. You know, they don't do this on their own charge. But they, them that do receive something, Right? Look at verse 8. Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? Well, we read it all through the law period in, in the Old Testament, and the law said you were to give, right, a tithe and offerings, you know? But we're not in the church epistles. I understand that. We're in, we're not, we are in the church epistles, not in the Old Testament. Okay. Thanks for catching that. <laughs> verse uh, 9 says, for it is written in the law of Moses, thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the con. Does God care for the oxen? It's a question. Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? 
for our sakes, no doubt. God cares for people a lot more than oxen. He's sharing that for our sakes, that a man is worthy of his hire. This is written that he that plows should plow in hope, hope of receiving seed from his work. Every farmer knows that, right? And that he that threshes in hope, the guy that takes the crop and does the work with that to make it ready for people to be able to utilize, he's doing that in hope too. In hope should be partakers of the hope. They both want to receive something for this work they're doing. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing we should reap your carnal things? Do you think that's such a tough thing? If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? It seems like in the time when Paul is writing this, that the other people had no problem asking for their abundance, their giving. And Paul's saying, hey, what about the ministers that are right here in front of you? Right here in front of you. Ministering to you God's word. Who's ministering God's word to you? Think about that. That's who you should be thinking about when it comes to giving. You want whoever's ministering God's word to you to be free to do that. To have the time to do that. To have what he needs to do that. <laughs> Where am I? Uh, you just uh, if we sown spiritual things, is it a great thing that we reap your kind of things? If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? I read that. Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Paul says, you know, hey, we have the power, but we haven't waved it at you. You know, because what we're considered is considering more is the movement of God's word. We didn't want to hinder the gospel of Christ. Do we not know, do ye not know that they which minister about the holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Can it get any plainer? You know, they should live of the gospel. But if I have you, but I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be done unto me, for it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. He just wanted the word to be glorified and God to be glorified. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. I have to do this. I have to preach the gospel. It makes no difference if anyone abundantly shares or sends me tithings or anything. That makes no difference. I've got to move the word of God. That's what Paul's saying. I've got to do it. I just got to do it. You know, verse 17 for if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. See, Paul says, I'm going to preach this word and, you, and I'm not going to charge anyone for it. But what are you guys going to do? But what are you going to do? Pretty neat. Let's go to chapter 16 in 1 Corinthians. I think this stuff is great. 
I think that people just need to know how this works so that they can be blessed, be super blessed. And I'm going to keep showing it to you here because it even gets bigger. Look at uh, chapter 16, verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. And when it talks a collection for the saints, it's the saints as a whole, but the money comes to the ministers that work all the time at it. You know, they put all their time and energy at it, and they can make sure that everyone has what they need. Even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay up him in store, as God has prospered him. You lay up for God your increase. We've learned that in God's word. The, as God has prospered him, that there may be no gathering when I come. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liberality or your gift you know, your favor unto Jerusalem because they wanted to give to Jerusalem to the poor saints, the saints that uh, needed to lean on someone to help them make it through their days. You know what I mean? Their body and soul and stuff. So they could be free to minister God's word to people. When you have people that are free to minister God's word to you, in other words, that's the only thing they need to think about. That's their job. That's their duty. Then they can do so much more. Even, a, even the Apostle Paul, who wanted to do so much for people, if he had to work all day, he couldn't do nothing during the day. He'd have to do other things. Pretty neat. And it says, And if it be meat, and the word meat means you know, right on, cool, convenient, you know, that type of thing. If it's okay with you that I go also, they shall go with me. And another thing that you see here is it's a faithful men. Faithful men. Just like we saw in the records in the Old Testament. They found faithful men who would do a great job in distributing the contributions. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. One of the reasons that uh, it's taken me so long to teach this stuff, even though I've known a lot of it for many years, is because I didn't want to look like I was self-serving. You know, that I'm doing this just because I want someone to, to give me some money. I'd rather just have the word do the work. But there's lots of ministries throughout the entire country that need people to step up to the bar of God and help ministers out. And that's why I'm teaching this. That's why I wanted to do this teaching series. To let the word of God live and be real in people's lives. And in chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded into the riches of their liberality or their generous or their simple generous giving even though they were had opportunities right the adversary is a jerk they said we're going to give and to bear to and okay for to their power i bear record yea beyond their power they were willing of themselves praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. They wanted for us to do, hey, you take the fellowship of ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord 
and unto us by the will of God. See, the first thing they did is they gave themselves to the Lord and to the will of God. Insomuch that we desired Titus that as he had begun, so would so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Titus was really excited that the believers in Corinth really wanted to give and bless. And so he was excited about it. And he just wanted to see the finishing of this work. Verse 7, Therefore, as ye abound in everything, you wonderful believers, you abound in everything, in your believing, in faith, and in utterance, you have no problem speaking God's word and knowledge. You have the knowledge of God's word. And in all diligence, you really don't waste time. You're good believers. And in your love to us, see that you are bound in this grace also. See, you're good believers. You go to the fellowship. You witness like crazy. Don't forget this part too. This grace also. And I speak not by commandment, but by an occasion of the forwardness of others to prove your sincerity of your love. A love offering. <laughs> A love offering. You see this here? I, this is, I speak not by commandment. We don't have a commandment now to give the tithe and the offerings. We don't have that commandment. But we have an occasion to give, and by giving, we get blessed, which we're going to see as we continue to read. And it's a sincerity of your love. And I, that might be why they call it sometimes a love offer. It's the sincerity of your love. Look at this. For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes... He became poor. That's the same word that we looked at earlier. Crouch to be, to live on the arms of others. You know, it's that same word. You know, Jesus Christ became, for our sakes, became poor so that he could work full time for us. And that ye, through his poverty, same not the exact same word, but the same group of words with the same meaning. For his pop, you know, through his poverty might be rich. Now we know in the in the gospel period that Judas had the bag of money. Someone had money. We know that Jesus Christ didn't work because he couldn't do all that stuff that he did in one year if he was had a job to go to. We also know that. Peter, in the fishing business, he blessed him with a catch of fish that was unbelievable. And he had money, so somebody must have been helping him. And that is exactly what I think is here. Now, some people say he became poor, you know, in spirit that, you know, you know in meekness and stuff. I don't even, that's all a bunch of crap. I think he literally said... I'm going to move God's word. I'm the son of God. I got things to do. And people said, yeah. And they helped him. And God helped him too. I mean, that's how you get such a big fish collection. <laughs> yeah. Verse 10 says, And herein is my advice, Paul speaking. And this is expedient for you. This is good for you. This is expedient could be translated benefit. This is a benefit for you who have have begun before not only to do but also to uh, also to be forward a year ago. They were thinking about doing this for a year. Now there perform the doing of it that as there was a readiness of will so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. For if there be, be first a willing mind is accepted according to that which what a man hath and not according to what he hath not. In other words, you always give what you have. The increase 
the increase, whatever increase you have this week, take a percentage. In the Old Testament, it was 10% and give it to God. Actually, it was a lot more than 10%. But you just give it to God. How do you, who do you give it to? You can't. You know, God has no arms coming down with a hand. You have to find ministers of God. Find, you do it. You find the ministers. You know, people that, we're going to get into it. I'll just keep going. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Verse 13, for I mean not that other men be eased and you be burdened. That's not the reason. It's verse 14, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want. That their abundance also may be a supply for your want. That there may be a quality for the ministers. Sometimes in a, an area it has an abundance. And in another area, or another group of believers, they don't have an abundance, and the ministers are not free to work like they should, and so they give to those ministers so they are free to work. You've got to see that this is really talking about ministers, so that they can do their job. Verse 15, as it is written, he that hath gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. But thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. See, Titus wanted to perform this for them. He wanted to guide them through it. For indeed, he accepted the exhortation. But being more forward of his own accord, he went unto you. And we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. And not only that, but who was also chosen of the churches to travel with us with this grace. So Titus and this other guy, they wanted to help them with this performing of this bounty, they called it, or this gift, or this sharing which is a minister by us to the glory of the same Lord in declared declaration of your ready mind that you wanted to do this. Now it's time to do it, is what he's saying. And Titus is, was on your side the whole way and he's going to help you through this. Verse 20. Avoiding this, that no man should blame us in this abundance, which is administrated by us. Um, and one of the things that I see here that we got to just remind ourselves, faithful men, faithful men, you know, they wanted to see and they administered by us faithful men and they sent faithful men, providing for honest things, faithful and honest things, right? Man, for not only in the sight of, of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. We have sent with them our brother, whom we have oftentimes proved, oftentimes proved diligent in many things. Good guy. But now much more diligent upon this great confidence which I have in you. Whether... Any do require of Titus, he's my partner and fellow uh, helper concerning you. He's a good guy, and our brethren be required of. They are the messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ. Therefore show ye to them and before the churches the proof of your love. And our boasting on your behalf. We've been boasting about you guys. Chapter 9, verse 1. Let's just keep reading. It says, And as touching the ministering to the saints, the ministers, it is super futilous, superfluous, superfluous for me to write to you for I know the forwardness of your mind. 
for which I boast of you to them at Mecca that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal has provoked very many. People heard about your wanting to give, and they said, hey, we're going to do the same. They can't be the only ones giving. We're going to give. You know? Verse 3, Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that as I said, ye may be ready. You're ready to give. Least happy. If they of Mesopotamia come with me and find you unprepared, we, or that we should say, not you, the us, should be ashamed for this same confident boasting. It's like saying, hey, we got the best fellowship, and they, they're ready to give when they get there. Most of them don't show up, and the ones that did didn't give. <laughs> not a good looking scene. And Paul would be embarrassed. See that? Verse 5, therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up before your bounty. Just get it together. Therefore, ye had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. In other words, it's just a bounty or a blessing or a giving. Now, here we go into things that most people read, so I'll read it too. This I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap bount also bountifully. Every farmer and then people that plant, they know if you plant a lot, you get a lot. If you just plant a little, you get a little. When we give, we're planting. We're planting for our abundance, our future abundance. You know, and every man according as he purposed in his heart. He, you know, he looks at his situation. He looks at his life. He looks at God's word and he purposes in his heart. So let him give, not grudgingly. Oh, you mean I got to, not that. Or necessity. If I do this every week, I'll be all right. You know, no. Not of necessity. For God loveth a cheerful giver. A giver that knows that when he gives, God outdoes him. God blesses him. Um, God loves a cheerful giver. And verse 8. And this is one of these verses, you know, that people pull out of the context and write on their walls and I've done it. I kind of like the verse myself, you know, but it's in the context of giving. Let's read it. And God is able to make all grace abound towards ye, that ye always have an all sufficient. See, in all things may abound to every good work. As you give, you get all grace, all abundance, all. The doors are open big for you. You know, they're open big for you. Now, if you don't give, if you don't, you know, share abundantly, if you share sparingly or not at all, does God still, grace still help you? Yes, it does. It does. Uh, it does, but you know what? When you give, it abounds towards you. God will still watch over you. God loves you. You're going to be all right if you believe in God. You're going to get some grace and some abundance, but not the abundance that you would like for your life. Let's read a little more. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad. He that giveth to the poor, his righteousness remain forever. Now he that ministers seed to the sower, both ministers bread for your food and multiplies your seed sown. Multiplies your seed sown and increases the fruit of of your righteousness. The fruit of your righteousness increases. In other words, 
Fruit is something you can see, and your righteousness abounds with this fruit. In other words, you're blessed. You're doing what Jesus Christ said. He says, I have come that you might have life, and you might have it more abundantly. That happens when you, uh, your fruit of righteousness increases. This week, I got a text from uh, some people who know God's word, and they asked me a question. They said, the question was a simple one. They said, we are, we are going through some persecution and troubles and stuff, and you know, and I said to my husband, it's because we've turned away from God. And he has said, no, no, God doesn't do that, you know. And, and they should talk to me to find out the answer. You know, well, the answer is God never brings persecution onto anyone. We know that. But you know what? If you're not sowing abundantly, you're not getting it all. If you... Uh, do not support ministers of God's word. If you do not support fellowships, if you never attend, you just have a knowledge of God's word. You know that God's good and he brings no uh, ill and it's the adversary that brings all the ill. Well, that's great to know that, but how does that help you? It doesn't help you. This is when, the, this is when you find yourself in situations like that, you draw near unto God and the adversary will flee. You need to know God's word. You need to be acting on God's word. Uh, if you do not give, you're in, if you do not give, I would say you're sowing sparingly, but you might not be sowing at all. And what will you get? You, well, if you're smart, you're a good businessman, you will make good decisions, and your business will do well, and the adversary will take all your money. <laughs> you know, because you're smart, you know how to run a business, you know that you can do it again, and you give little time to God. The adversary knows that you're not in fellowship, you're not fellowshipping with like minded believers, you're in a bad place, and he just takes your money. So you know how to make it, and the adversary takes it away. Then you find yourself, and I've seen this over and over again, where people who have some knowledge of God's word get blessed. Oh, you know, because of some knowledge they have, and but at the same time, the adversary keeps on racking and ruining their lives. And man, I wish they'd stop that. It's so much more beneficial to get into God's word and apply the principles in God's word to live abundant lives. It's just more fun. Um. Uh, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. So the blessings of God fall on everybody. And you can take that when you see it and utilize it and be blessed. So you can have some grace, some, you know, aboundings happening to you. God never stops that from happening. But without a connection with God, the adversary can come along and wipe you out and, and always keep you in a place of anxiety because you're not getting your needs met and you don't really understand why. And you go, well, it's not God that's doing it. Well, that's true. But what good does it do to know that it's the adversary and you, can't, and you don't do nothing about it? Let's do something about it. This is one way to do something about it. That's why I've been teaching it. Okay, let's keep reading. It says, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which uh, uh, causes through us thanksgiving to God. You know, when you start seeing God bless you, you, you're pretty thankful to God. For the administration of this service is not only supplied for the wants of the saints, and we know what that means now, right? You know, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings to God. Twice in a row, it uses that thanksgiving to God. While by the experiment of this ministration, 
they glorify God for your professed subject, objection, unto the gospel of Christ, and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all. And by their prayers for you, which long after you, for your exceeding grace, for the exceeding grace of God in you, the favor of God upon your life. You get blessed all the time. God blesses you. You're not lucky. You're blessed. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Pretty neat, huh? All right, we're going to keep going. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. In the subject of giving and receiving. Is this making more sense to somebody? Oh, good. We'll go. All right, and chapter, I'm going to keep going. Number, chapter 6, verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, that's terrible, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. The spirit of meekness is kind of an interesting thing. It means, you know, not judging. It means not... It really means with a soft voice saying, Hey, come here. I can help you. I see what, what you've been doing. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You could be tempted too. Bear ye one another's burden, and so fulfill the law of Christ, which is the love of God in the renewed mind, in manifestation. For if a man think of thinks himself to be something when he is nothing he deceiveth himself that's what the guy does that you know is a really smart person and he figures out life and he knows the angles and he uses them and he does well he thinks he's got it made you know he doesn't realize that there's a spiritual world going on and even though god brings great blessings he's got to give to god he's got to be blessed with god he deceives himself but let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Verse 6 says, Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teaches in all things. Just want to look at this verse for a second. It says, Let him that is taught in the word someone's teaching you the word then it says communicate and that means a full sharing unto him that teaches in all good things um, one of the things i find interesting about this is, let him that is taught the spirit and how to no it doesn't say that it says the word the word the word it doesn't say the man that comes and teaches you the spirit who the hell knows what that is? The only way to know what that is is from the Word. That's the only way. Let him that is taught in the Word, that's the guy you communicate with. Full sharing, the one that teaches the Word in all things. Verse 7. Be not mocked. <laughs> Be not deceived. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. No matter what you think, you know, your God knows your heart. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, remember from the Corinthians, soweth, that shall he also reap. What are you sowing? Okay? For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Not a very good thing. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Cool stuff. Let us not be worry of well-doing. You know, we're going to, you know, when you start to, to operate giving, you start to do this, start to receive, uh, you can get blessed. You will be blessed, right? You'll be blessed. Uh, but you know what? It might not happen the first week. 
You know, you give the first week, you have all kinds of needs, and they all don't get filled that first week. Well, then you have to be patient. It says, let us not be worry in well-doing. And let me tell you another thing. Uh, it might happen the first week. God can do what God does. For in due season he shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all. That's what we do, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. And in the Greek is the article the, the household of the faith, the right way of believing, which is cool stuff. I want to close, and I'll get you happy about that, in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 10. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me has flourished again. Paul's saying, I'm blessed, I'm rejoicing in the Lord that you cared for me again. Therein ye were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therein to be content. He says, not that I speak in respect of want. The word want means to come up short or to come up last. In other words, if he doesn't have everything he needs, um, he's content. That's what it says. He doesn't, whatever state he's in, he's content. He knows God loves him. He knows that what his opportunities and his job is, and he's content. Verse 12 says, I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. I know how to abound, right? Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need. So it's just three different ways of saying the same thing. I know how to handle it if there's a lot here, and I know how to handle it if there's nothing here, if I need, have need. And he does it by this verse 13, which says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. He does all things through Christ, which strengtheneth him. This is one of those verses that people pull out of the context, put it on their refrigerators, and they sing to themselves, you know, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. But it's taught in the context of giving and receiving. Paul says, if you give or if you don't give, I'm going to move the word. He just said that in Corinthians, Galatians. Now I'm going to keep moving God's word. Verse 14, notwithstanding, ye have done well. Ye did communicate with my affliction. You did do good. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Mecca, no church communicated or fully shared with me as concerning giving and receiving. And that's why I call this series Giving and Receiving. Paul calls it Giving and Receiving. I'll call it Giving and Receiving. No church communicated with him. In other words, they didn't full share, fully share with him concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity. You made it possible for me to move the word there. I am blessed, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit may abound to your account. In Corinthians, it says the fruit of righteousness. Fruit may abound to your account. When you give, you get blessed. Remember that? Pressed down, shaking together, running over. It, that's the way it happens. Blessed, I'm happy, I walk around, I get good deals all the time. Why? God takes care. I don't even see some of the deals. I just know, hey, I got money in my bank and account, I don't really know how. You know, that type of thing, because God blesses us. Verse 18 says, But I have all and abound. 
I am full, having received of Epiditus the things which were sent from you. You sent unto me. Good stuff. An odor of a sweet smell. That's what he called it. A sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. When you do this, when you give this way, it is a sacrifice acceptable and well-pleasing to God. And verse 19 is the last verse in this teaching series. And the first word is not but. There's no but about it. It's the word and. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And this is another one of those verses they pull out. Let's read the context. It's all about giving and receiving a sweet, uh, smelling, a sacrifice, acceptable and well-pleasing to God. It's well-pleasing to God. Well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I'm counting on that. I'm depending on God taking care of me. That's how I live my life. I just want to teach God's word as long as I can to help people with the things of God. And this subject of giving and receiving will bless people so much if they will do it. And it will bless the movement of God's word. It will bless God's ministers. They will be encouraged to do more. They will be encouraged to do more because they know that people... uh, like them. They're accepted of them. They're thought of as as men and women of God that are doing things for God. And that's who you give your abundance to. That's who you give your uh, gifts to. And when you do that, God blesses you back. Well, that's my teaching, and that's the end of this segment on The church epistles, doctrine, reproof, and correction for us. And we can live more abundant lives that Jesus Christ came to make available by doing God's word. Well, dear God, I'm just thankful and blessed that I have the ability to look at this and teach it. I hope that people will tap into it and live really wonderful, abundant lives. And I just thank you for this in the name of your wonderful Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are a listener-supported podcast. I want to thank those who generously give so that we can keep the podcast available. The podcast is heard around the world for all those who would want to know how to accurately understand the Bible when they read The episode is complete, so head over to stevejanes.com. While there, sign up for our newsletter. If you're interested in learning how to read the Bible, there's also an audio class and companion books available on How to Read the Bible for Understanding and Power. The website has audio teachings and biblical studies books all there to help you grow in God's grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen next week for another reading of God's wonderful, matchless word.